in the beginning, God. Those four words give us a foundation of eternal hope. Amen. But in Satan, those four words produced jealousy and hatred. The Revelation tells us there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. The great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now what? Now the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It was into such an environment that man was introduced. Now heaven's desire was made very clear. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so God created man knowing full well that the serpent was waiting. Satan had fomented successful rebellion in heaven. Would he do so on earth? God created man in his own image, yet the devil was waiting for the newly formed couple, ready to impose his selfish will and his sinful image upon man. God breathed into man the breath of life. Satan was waiting to breathe into him the poison of lies. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? With those words, the serpent began to insinuate himself into relationship with the woman. Yet he did so with purpose. Satan cared nothing for God's creation. His only desire was to hurt God through the subversion and destruction of man. Now the woman, she knew the command of God. She corrected the serpent, although the serpent had not misspoke. He knew exactly what he was saying. But the woman says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Oh, one more, one more piece. And Satan's trap would be complete. You surely shall not die. There's nothing that creates doubt faster than contradiction. And the wicked seed bore fruit. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave it to her husband with her and he ate. The rebellion that had begun in heaven had made its way to earth. But as in heaven, God steps in very quickly. It is quite clear that the devil instigated the woman's disobedience, knowing the penalty for such behavior. But did he care that the man and woman would surely die? No, not at all. He lied to the woman to produce that intended result. Now, the man and the woman would be dealt with for their disobedience, but the Lord's first comments are for the leader of the rebellion, for the one who had proven in heaven and on earth to be a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. God steps in very quickly to tell the devil of his end. Thus he says to the serpent in our text, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman. That God should have to put enmity between the serpent and the woman suggests to me at least that there had been a measure of friendship between them. What a hard thing it must have been for the woman to realize, though, that that friendship was only one-sided. How difficult it must have been for her to admit, the serpent deceived me. But you would think that that kind of a betrayal would make it easier to understand why it was God's will in this matter to introduce enmity into the relationship. Now, before I get too far afield, I want you to know what the word enmity means. It is synonymous with the word hostility. It is defined as the extreme hatred that exists between enemies. So let's look at it this way. Following on the tail end of Brother Ricky's sermon, God began his mission of mercy with the interjection of holy hatred. The psalmist says of the Lord, Thou art not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. Amen. No evil dwells with thee. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Now the scriptures do not say, as is so common in churches today, that God hates the sin but loves the sinner. The scripture says, thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Ezekiel puts it even more simply, the soul who sins will die. Amen. Well now, wait a minute. Why is God not more tolerant? I'll tell you why. Because as the apostle John explains, the one who practices sin is of the devil. In her one act of disobedience, the woman, what she'd really done is to align herself with the chief enemy of God. God is not going to tolerate that kind of rebelliousness. It was enmity which caused the Lord to eject Satan from heaven. It was enmity which caused God to evict the man and the woman from the garden. And it is the same Spirit of God who moved James to tell us that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He jealously desires the Spirit to dwell in us. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. Now, neither angels nor women produce seed in a biological sense. Therefore, it is obviously appropriate we understand this passage in a spiritual sense. From the beginning point of Genesis 3.15... The Holy Spirit proceeds through the rest of the scriptures to the very end to tell us about the conflict between righteousness and unrighteousness. There is not one book of the Bible that does not show us a measure of the enmity between God and Satan. And we don't have to wait very long for the very first example, Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel, the initial representatives of the serpent seed and the woman seed. Both of those men made sacrifices to God. Cain's worship, however, was unacceptable. He brought to the Lord some of the fruits of the ground. What was God's reaction to that sacrifice? For Cain and his offering, the Lord had no regard. 
His rather casual attitude toward worship revealed that there was a deficiency in his heart and his offering proved unacceptable. Amen. On the other hand, Abel's offering to God was commendable. He offered the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. He gave the best parts of the best animals. He approached God in faith. And that, according to Hebrews 11.4, made his sacrifice more excellent. Amen. Now, Cain, he didn't like God's divine evaluation. The scriptures tell us he was very angry toward God, and he resented his brother. His enmity was clearly reflected in his facial features. Now the Lord tried to warn Cain about the dangerous direction that his life was taking. Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Those questions were designed to make Cain take pause and to reflect upon the justification of his anger. And then comes a third question designed to call attention to the basic simplicity of a right relationship with the Lord. If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if Cain was determined not to do what was right, then sin, like a ferocious beast, was crouching at the door. Amen. We know what Satan's plan was. It was the serpent's desire to overpower and dominate Cain. Like his mother before him, Cain had a choice to make. But Cain did not heed the warning of the Lord. Anger opened the door and sin devoured him. He killed his brother in the field. Why? The scriptures tell us it was because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Amen. Under the curse of God, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He went forth to build a godless society east of Eden in Nod, the land of wandering. From Cain and from Seth, who was the spiritual substitute for righteous Abel, two families arose with very different values. The descendants of Cain represented the seed of the serpent. Cain's clan was concerned primarily with their inventiveness and culture. It was the line of Cain which gave us such great things like, let's see, polygamy and murder. None of their activities included submission to God. But then Genesis chapter 5 opens up with a very beautiful reminder of the great truths concerning the creation and supreme importance of man created in the likeness of God. And as you progress on through that fifth chapter, it becomes very clear that Seth's descendants representing the seed of woman were different. They were committed to more spiritual values. And there were two in particular, Noah and Enoch, who are said to have walked with God. These were men who bore witness against the wickedness of the world. And when you consider the line of Seth in the scriptures, we see the reward that accompanied such faithfulness. Those listed patriarchs lived a long time. Their average age, excluding Enoch, who was taken up by God, was 912 years. But, again with the exception of Enoch, every one of them, every biography given, concludes with the solemn toll of the funeral bell. Why? Because from Adam onward, death had dominion. Fulfilling God's word, thou shalt surely die. Let's go back to the man and woman. After they disobeyed God and had their eyes opened, it seems likely they were anticipating a swift fulfillment of that death promise. Yet instead, here's what they heard. They heard God speaking to the serpent about the seed of woman. Now they should have overheard that judgment as a very hopeful promise because that's exactly how it was intended. Amen. 
there would be a future for mankind. But unfortunately, with the passing of years, the seed of serpent became more prolific. While the seed of woman diminished to the point of being represented by one man, his three sons, and their four wives. Genesis 6 points out the contrast between those two communities. The opening verses of Genesis 6 paints a very dismal picture of human degradation. Surveying the scene on earth, God declared that man was just like flesh. He was acting on the level of the animal kingdom. He was acting like the serpent. Men were acting like those not made in the image of God. Every intent of the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. God was grieved in his heart by the corruption of man. And finally, the great judge pronounced a sentence against his creatures. My spirit shall not strive with man forever. I will blot out man whom I have created. Now don't get too depressed. Noah was an exception to the general picture of corruption and violence on the earth. This man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Why? Because Noah was a righteous man. Because his life measured up to the standards of God. He was blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. But then the world was destroyed by flood. Only eight souls were saved, we know that. Where does the seed of serpent and the seed of woman go from here? The scriptures are very quick to remind us. In Genesis chapters 9 and 10, we see the descendants of Noah's youngest son, Ham, represent the seed of Satan. While the descendants of Shem representing the seed of woman lead us eventually to a man whose name was Abraham. And to that man Abraham, and we know we're on the right spiritual track, because God revealed himself to Abraham and made this promise. I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed will possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Now, do I need to go on any further and trace any more of the covenant line? No, not really, because at this point, Galatians 3.16 jumps in and tells us exactly where all of this is going. The promises that were spoken to Abraham and his seed. He doesn't say to seeds, is referring to many, but rather to one, to your seed, that is Christ. Now you consider that information as we again read a portion of our text. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. The man and the woman were given the hope of a future, but what they didn't know was that the seed of woman would culminate in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. And it is so important for us to understand this. This is why the scriptures trace the covenant line with such care. And this is also why the Lord repeats the promise of a seed at various intervals throughout biblical history. We heard the promise to Abraham. Later to David, the Lord says, I've made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Then we go on to the time of the prophets and a Messiah is announced. And Isaiah very firmly declares him to be the holy seed. Now I want to throw in a little piece of information here for what it's worth. One of those things they teach us in Bible college. Pretty basic actually. You'd think you would have learned it a long time before Bible college. The gospel by definition, is the good news concerning the Christ. Like I said, should have learned that a long time before we got to Bible college. If that is the case, if the gospel is the good news concerning the Christ, then God himself was the first gospel preacher announcing to the serpent that there would always be enmity between them. 
and of Christ, the seed of woman. It is said in Hebrews 1, 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. Oh, I can just hear the apostle pleading, Little children, don't let anyone deceive you. This is not hard. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as the Lord is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God, our holy seed, appeared for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. That is why we are told to depart from evil and do good so that we will abide forever. The Lord loves justice. We are told very clearly, the Lord loves justice. He does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished, but the descendants of the righteous will be delivered. Now, folks, that's true even to this day. The descendants, the seed of the righteous will be delivered. But I want you to know right up front, and I think most of you probably do, but I'll say it anyway, this is not about physical descent, and it never has been. Amen. This is not about the flesh. This is about faith. God did not choose men like Seth and Noah and Abraham and David because they were born of a certain race, but because they believed in the promise of God. Amen. And the same thing is true today. Speaking physically... Genesis 3.20 tells us that the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, unfortunately, though, because of disobedience, death is the end of every man. So much for the physical life. But we don't have to worry about the physical life. Romans 9.8 testifies those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. The children of the promise are counted as the seed. Amen. And Jesus, speaking spiritually, gives us wonder, wonderful news that supersedes whatever Eve's name might mean. He says, I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. You see, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman are still very much represented in the world today. And there is still enmity between his seed and her seed. What partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony does Christ have with the serpent? What does the synagogue of Satan have to do at all with the bride of Christ? Amen. Onward, Christian soldiers. Why? Because you have been born again of seed, not which is perishable, but that which is imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. And the conflict will continue through the seed of Christ until Satan is ultimately defeated. That's why we're told, submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Amen. Oh, I tell you, the hope that Paul must have had as he said, Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. And you shall bruise him on the heel. Now the image that is presented there is of simultaneous injuries. One is brought about by the other. Take a walk barefoot through the clover sometime and eventually you're going to step on a bee. I've been stung before in such a manner. Hey, it hurts. But the damage to my foot's temporary. The damage to the bee's permanent. 
So it was with Christ, the seed of woman. Consider the damage that was done to him as a result of Satan's warfare. He was despised. He was forsaken of men, smitten of God and afflicted, pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, oppressed and afflicted. Absolutely. At every step on this earth, the serpent delighted in taunting the Christ because of his enmity, his hostility toward him. I tell you, one of the wonderful things about the scriptures is that there are usually so much going on down under the level that you don't see. Take the temptation of Jesus, for example. We're familiar with the passage from Matthew chapter 4. The devil took Jesus into the holy city. He had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and he said to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you. On their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Wait a minute. The serpent quoting the Bible? Yes. He quoted a passage of scripture from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Why did the serpent use that particular passage? Could it be that he was taunting Christ because he knew that the very next verse of that passage, Psalm 91, 13, says this concerning the Christ, the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Yeah. Satan knows exactly what's going on. Yes, Satan bruised the heel of Christ. During his incarnation, Jesus was the target of ridicule and criticism, temptation and persecution. He suffered and he died. But in his resurrection, the seed of woman crushed the head of the serpent. Thanks be to God who always leads us in the triumph in Christ. Amen. Now much has been said this evening of the enmity between God and Satan. You need to know this though. Not once has God ever deigned to meet Satan on the battlefield as an equal. Amen. When Satan rebelled in heaven, it was Michael and his angels who expelled him. The devil was then cast down to the earth where he continues his insurgency against the will of the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to belittle the power of Satan. The serpent certainly has a measure of power. The scriptures say that he's the prince of the power of the air. It is his spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. But for all his pride and bravado, the devil is still only a created being. Yes, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but catch this, the Son of God, the seed of woman, came to this world in a form lower than the angels, and he beat the serpent on his own field. Since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Brothers and sisters, the bottom line is this. Christ in you is the only hope of glory. Amen. Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope, then let's put our hope and our trust in these precious promises, some of which we've already heard in this particular event this morning. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Gone. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Done. But here's where we come in. Brethren, we have a choice. We have the same choice that the woman had in the garden. We may choose to believe God or to believe Satan. Who's telling the truth? We face the same choice as Cain. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not 
do well. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. I pray that you make the right choice. In order to help you do so, God wants you to know how the conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of woman will end. Sometimes I get on to my daughter. She's got a bad habit in her novels of skipping to the end of the story and seeing how it ends. In that particular case, that may not be such a good thing. Where God is concerned, he wants us to know right up front how it ends. So I close this evening without further comment with the words from the one who would crush the serpent's head. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 36. Jesus' disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and they'll cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear.